everybody, this is the Vikram. So, did I want a sequel to Kick-Ass? The short answer is yes, especially, you know, because how the original movie ended when Red Mist is sitting in his office and having his, you know, Joker moment, wait until they get a load of me and stuff like that. And I was so hyped for the sequel. I was a little less hyped when it came out that Matthew Vaughn wasn't going to sit in the director's chair for the sequel, but I thought we still have all of these colorful characters and we still have the fantastic story. So this should be awesome. I saw the movie and I was very, very disappointed to the point where I, in a sort of Mandela effect way, actually thought that the original Kick-Ass was a bit of an overrated movie. So I rewatched both of these movies in preparation for this review and what I came across was a little bit surprising. Kick-Ass is a fantastic movie, almost as good as the even better movie Super uh, starring uh, Rain Wilson, but that's a story for another time. But I also found out that my dislike for Kick-Ass 2 was a little bit misguided. Still, the movie has all the problems that uh, I thought it had when I watched this movie originally and I will point them out for you, but there is also a thing that this movie had that I didn't remember was as good as it was. So while being an inferior movie to the first one, it is still a hell of an entertaining movie. But let's find out what this movie is about, what its pros and what its cons are. This is Kick-Ass 2. feels a little bit lost. The thing is that he hasn't been kick-ass for, you know, a number of years because, you know, it is hazardous for your health. But he wants to make a comeback and try to fit in society and try to, you know, uh, find his place in society. Uh, so he teams up with Hit Girl, who has still, you know, been doing vigilante things uh, over these years, much to the chagrin of Marcus, her guardian, you know, Nicolas Cage's best friend from the first movie. The thing is that he says that, Mindy, you're 15 years old and you cannot do this. And he gives her an ultimatum that stop being hit girl and, you know, be a regular normal 15 year old girl and, you know, hang out with the cool kids. So that's essentially what she's doing. She abandons kick ass mid training and start hanging out with the cool kids, which effectively writes out hit girl for the majority of this movie. Boo! But that's okay because, you know, uh, Kika starts hanging out with a bunch of other losers that also dresses up as superheroes. They are led by Colonel Stars and Stripes, played by Jim Carrey. We'll get to him in a second. And he finds a group that, you know, are willing to accept him with all his flaws. And he, you know, has found a new place to sort of call home. And he also gets a new girlfriend, the Night Bitch. So things are looking up for a good old kick-ass, but on the other side of town a problem is slowly brewing because Red Mist has not forgiven kick-ass for, you know, the death of his father and he is uh, plotting revenge. He has apparently been plotting revenge for quite a long time, several years actually. The reason why he hasn't, you know, done anything about it until now is because his mom, played by Jancy Butler, is, you know, keeping him in their house as a sort of uh, combination of house guest and the prisoner, you know, for his own good. Your father wasn't killed by superheroes. He died in a fire, she says. But after he accidentally kills her in a tanning bed related accident, those things can be quite hazardous, you know. He snaps completely and he dresses up in his mother's bondage gears and calls himself the motherfucker and the motherfucker's plan is very simple he's going to start recruiting different sort of whacked up super villains and you know become the world's first actual factual super villain and he's going to form this group of marauders and the uh, merry band of uh, juvenile delinquents and he's going to you know kill kick-ass that is his goal not take over the world or you know kill a satellite or world domination or anything like that he just wants to kill kick-ass i like the simplicity about it so what's going to happen when you know the motherfucker and the kick-ass 
uh, comes to blows. We shall see. Now this movie had so much creativity and had so many colorful characters and it had so many absurd situations. So this movie should have been a winner, you know, in a layup. But they put just so many hurdles in front of themselves that they couldn't help tripping over them and effectively making a less good movie than the first one. But the biggest problem with this thing is, of course, Hit Girl. Hit Girl was the best thing about uh, Kick-Ass. Hit Girl was so fun with her perfect blending of psychotic and naivete. And the thing was that Hit Girl and Big Daddy was such a cool pairing and they were fantastic. And the Big Daddy sized hole that, you know, uh, is in this movie because, you know, Big Daddy is dead because he died in the last movie. Um, that was a thing that you know, could have been filled with you know, more hit girl shenanigans. But because hit girl's sort of arc in this movie is essentially to uh, remake um, Mean Girls, was very jarring. So as I said, Hit Girl is you know hanging out with Brooke and this movie's version of the plastics and is trying to sort of fit in despite being a bit of an outsider. And I hated this section of the movie. It was so boring, it was so jarring, and it was so difficult to you know crowbar that thing in to this movie because if you remove it the movie stays exactly the same. If Hit Girl would have been hit by a car and would have you know, been hospitalized for the same amount of time, it would have made no difference. I guess they wanted you know, Hit Girl to have this sort of arc, sort of, but all of these sequences were so tedious and they were so long and they were so boring and, as I said, amounted to almost nothing except the six stick sequence. I like that sequence a lot. And we also have a problem with this movie when it comes to the director, because not having Matthew Vaughan in this movie uh, damaged this movie a lot, because they don't have the same uh, great combination of absurd humor and ultraviolence. They have the ultraviolence and they have absurd situations, but they aren't that funny. And sequences that should have been hilarious and hysterical just aren't. There is something that is missing. And we also have another problem with this movie. And that is that there are sequences in this movie that are so brutal and so unpleasant that you cannot do a you know, funny sequence afterwards because it is simply too jarring. You cannot crowbar the thing into. So maybe, even if we would have had Matthew Vaughan, maybe the movie wouldn't have worked anyway. But I don't know. But I just get the feeling that this movie put, as I said, unnecessary hurdles in front of itself and it, you know, kept falling over. But the last 25 minutes of this movie is absolutely fantastic. The big, uh, you know, uh, warehouse brawl with all the supervillains and the superheroes and all this incredibly silly nonsense was very, very fun. And in the hands of a Matthew Vaughan, would it have been great? It would have been absolutely fantastic. And let's also talk about another thing. Colonel Stars and Stripes. This movie was sort of marketed on, you know, uh, his uh, presence in this movie, you know, played by Jim Carrey. And I went into this movie thinking, man, this is going to be the big return for Jim Carrey because since the turn of the millennium, he has not done that many good movies and almost no good comedies. This should work excellently, but for some reason, he wasn't an interesting character. He's probably the least memorable character in the entire movie. And uh, Jim Carrey seems to, you know, run on fumes in this movie and basically phoning it in. This movie was also kind of infamous for the fact that Jim Carrey refused to do press junkets and disavowed the movie uh, when it was released because he was, you know, anti-gun violence, which was a thing that uh, was all over the media at that point. So, he refused to do uh, press junkets for the movie. Yeah, that's a great idea, Carrie. They'll show them. So many people actually blame that thing for, you know, this movie underperforming at the box office. For me, I blame this uh, movie's uh, failure at the box office mostly as contributed to the fact that it wasn't as good as the first one and that the first one was not this mega success either. So there wasn't, you know, a huge demand for uh, a sequel to Kick-Ass. But... Should you see this movie? Yes, I think you should, because it is an entertaining movie. 
very entertaining characters and there are absurd situations that are so entertaining and there are action sequences in this movie that is legitimately really really spectacular and has a lot of fun gore to itself and I mean the super villains are so much fun Black Death, Mother Russia and the pace in this movie you know excluding the hit girl sequences are actually quite good and there are you know sequences in this movie that are so entertaining and it's actually quite funny so it is a mixed bag, but the things that are good are very, very good. But the thing that is lackluster in this movie is very lackluster in this movie. So, Kick-Ass 2 is a flawed sequel, but it is far better than I remembered it to be. And it has, you know, individual moments that I think is even better than the original. But on the whole, it lacks something. And as I said, individual sequences in this movie is actually quite awesome. And the actors are great, especially Chloe Grace Morset, but it doesn't have the same playfulness as the first movie had. There is a lot of stuff that they could have done with this movie, but chose not to. I give Kick-Ass 2 61 points. As I said, inferior to the first one, but still a good movie. So I'll see you next time for Well So and So Reviewing Well, such and such. Thank you for watching. Thank you very much.